doing all kinds of things, blast from the past tonight. I've got Brother Dell reading for me. It's been a long time since he's read for me. <laughs> Poor Brother Dell, he, um, as most of you know, he works what they call the graveyard shift. And uh, many years ago, he was working Saturday nights. And he'd come in on Sunday morning before he was involved in Sunday school. And, uh, you know, any of us that have to work all night long are going to have a hard time keeping our eyelids open that next morning. And uh, so I figured out a way to keep him awake. I made him my reader. I said all that to say that's a warning to the rest of you. You fall asleep on me, you may be on the platform next. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. You know, he never fell asleep on the platform to my knowledge. I do know one preacher that his reader fell asleep while he was having him read. So at least I, I haven't added that to my repertoire yet. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 6 and uh, verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving... The principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permits. Now, the apostle here is telling us what the foundation is. The foundation is repentance, faith, baptism. All of these things. And uh, we began several weeks ago dealing with the doctrine of baptism. Tonight, the Lord willing, is going to be our fourth and final installment on this series of studies. And uh, we'll be moving on into some other things next week, if God permits. Uh, But for tonight, we're going to do our best to try to bring this series of studies to a close and um, try to deal with any questions and answers that uh, are questions and and uh, arguments that may be presented against the things that I've been teaching you over the last several weeks. And we want to try to uh, answer those things from the Word of the Lord. So let's pray one more time. Let's ask God to speak to our hearts together right now. We need the touch of the Lord to be in this service. Everybody, let's lift our voices to the Lord right now. Jesus, in your name, I thank you, God, for your goodness. God, I need you. I ask you, God, help me. I ask you, God, to use me, God, tonight. I need the touch of the Holy Ghost. God, I, I don't know what to do. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, would you just praise Him now before you're seated, everybody? Would you give the Lord some praise? Amen. Worship Him a little bit. Amen. Magnify His name. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. I, uh, again... um, I'm not going to do an extensive time of review tonight. I am going to do some review and uh, specifically on uh, the things that we covered in last week's lesson. And we will uh, just try to go through those things very quickly so we can get right into tonight's lesson. Uh, All of this began dealing with the question that was asked by Pontius Pilate uh, when Jesus stood before him. At the time of his crucifixion, and Pilate asked, what is truth? Uh, As we've pointed out to you the night before Jesus had given the answer to that question, John chapter 17 and verse 17 tells us that answer. Sanctify sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so that's the answer to the question. What is truth? The answer is God's word is truth. That's how we know what's right and what's wrong. It's got to be truth based upon the Word of God. Amen. I I am very, very firm in assuring this church that nobody 
No man on the face of the earth, no matter the title uh, which has been ascribed to him, no one has the authority to change the Word of God. God's Word is truth, and we must build our lives upon the Word of God. Amen. Our opinions are absolutely meaningless. We're not going to be judged based on what we think or what we believe. We are going to be judged by the never-changing Word of God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. In our uh, first study, we showed you how that Paul emphatically stated that there's only one true gospel. Amen. And anyone who preaches anything different than what the apostles preached is to be accursed. Amen. Galatians chapter 1 tells us, So we must never allow our tradition to stand in the way of God's truth. Tradition may be comfortable. Tradition may be convenient. Tradition may be familiar. But the truth will make us free. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, again, we, we've covered a lot of things over the last several weeks. We've discussed the issue of whether or not baptism is necessary for salvation. We went through that. We spent a good deal of time on that. We talked about the whole process of immersion or sprinkling when it comes to baptism. Hopefully we settled that issue in your mind. And then last week we began to deal with the issue of the name of Jesus uh, being mentioned at baptism. And we talked about a lot of things there. Amen. We talked about the importance of formulas uh, and, and how it is very important uh, how you were baptized. Amen. Jesus did not say, I am one of many ways, but he said, I am the way. There's only one way for us to be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. And so uh, we've already shown that baptism is a part of that, and so we need to know how the Bible teaches us to be baptized. We talked about the group in Acts 19 that were baptized by John the Baptist, but that baptism was not sufficient. They had to go back and be baptized again, and we learned later in the lesson that the reason they had to be baptized again was because it had to be done in the name of Jesus. Well, hallelujah. Amen. We, we talked about the command that Jesus gave in Matthew 28, 19, when he said that you are to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We talked about uh, obedience to that command versus repeating that command. In fact, I had someone just today ask me that question again. Why does it have to be in the name? Uh, they said, uh, uh, why is it Father, Son, Holy Ghost good enough? And so I went through it again, that it's, it's a matter of not just repeating what Jesus said, but doing what what Jesus said. And he said, baptize in the name. Father is not a name. Son is not a name. Holy Ghost is not a name. But Jesus is a name. And it's not just a name. It is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. We showed you how in John 5 and 43, the name of the Father is Jesus. Matthew 1, 21, the name of the Son is Jesus. John 14, 26, the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Amen. And we showed you how that throughout the New Testament, everybody that was ever baptized was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We gave all the scriptures for that. Uh, all of that is in our last lesson, Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 10.48, Acts 19.5, Acts 22.16. All of these examples show people being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And there is not one example anywhere in the scripture where anyone was ever baptized saying, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. Colossians 3 and 17 says we're to do everything in the name of Jesus. And everything includes water baptism. Amen. Amen. And then we went through some historical references. Uh, we read to you from books like the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, the Westminster Dictionary of Church History, the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, the New International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the Dictionary of the New Testament, Harper's Bible Dictionary, Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, the theology of the New Testament, and every one of these sources state that baptism in the early church was always done only in the name of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't until hundreds of years after the death of Christ that anybody was ever baptized 
saying, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It was always done in Jesus' name, and man changed it to a different formula. Amen. We also, last week, talked about the argument, I'd rather obey Jesus than Peter. And uh, we talked about, this is a common argument. I've had a lot of folks that have said that to me, but we discussed all the reasons why that's not a valid argument and why you really don't want to try to make that kind of a claim. Amen. And I can just tell you tonight that I wish people really would want to obey Jesus. Because if they really wanted to obey Jesus, they would be baptized by immersion in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Having said that, uh, we are going to now look at some of the arguments, not just against Jesus' name baptism, but against the doctrine of the necessity of baptism. And we're going to talk about those from the Scripture tonight uh, for the remainder of this lesson. So let's begin with one of the most common, and that is found in Luke chapter 23. If you'll follow along in your Bibles, Luke 23, verses 38 to 43. Let's read this familiar story together. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou, thou art in the same condemnation? And he and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our de- of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All right, now this is an interesting, an interesting passage of Scripture. And the argument is brought up and, and, and has been brought up many, many times to me and no doubt to many of you as well, that here is a man who is saved without being baptized. The question is, how can you preach that baptism is necessary if the thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized? Well, I want us to go back and look at something here. Let's go back to verse 42 for just a moment. And I want us to see the prayer that he prayed. His prayer was, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Did he repent? Did he ask God to forgive him? Have we not already established that repentance is necessary? Is anybody going to tell me that any sinner can simply say the words, Lord, remember me, and they're saved. I don't think so. Uh, If that's all it takes, then it's a whole lot easier than anything we've seen in the Scripture for the many weeks we've been studying this. And and Jesus saying, you must be born of water and spirit, really. If, If this is all it takes, saying, Lord, remember me, then John 3 and 5 is not necessary. No other scripture in all the Word of God is necessary. All we've got to do is say, Lord, remember me. Obviously, there's a problem with trying to compare our salvation to the salvation of the thief on the cross. Now look, we understand this, that we are today living in what is known as the church age. But the church did not begin until the day of Pentecost. We can no more compare the salvation of the thief on the cross to ours than we can compare the salvation of Moses to ours. Moses didn't live during the church age. Abraham didn't live during the church age. Was Abraham saved? I believe he was. But he wasn't saved the way we're saved. And so when we look at a man who died before the church age, you can't look at his salvation and compare it to the salvation that is required of us today. It's really not a difficult difficult thing 
for us to answer. Amen. Uh, we, we know uh, that the Holy Ghost was not even given at this time. We see this in, in John chapter 7, verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. All right. So until Jesus was glorified, nobody could receive the Spirit of God. The thief on the cross did not receive God's Spirit. Well, hallelujah. He couldn't, according to the Scripture. Jesus hadn't even died at this point, let alone been glorified. So we can in no way take this man and his salvation and try to prove what God requires of sinners today. Just doesn't work. Praise God. Amen. If we want to find out about what God requires today, we go to the church age. We go to the book of Acts. We find out what's preached in the book of Acts. That tells us about people being saved. Well, praise God. Amen. All right, let's look at another one here. Uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Again, I, I get this thrown up to me a lot. So let's look at it. Acts 16 and verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. All right, now, people say that all Paul told this jailer was just believe. And that's all that's necessary for salvation. Because that's all he said, was just believe. Well, it is true that he said believe. But it is not true that that's all he said. Now, let's, let's think about this scenario. Let's think about what's going on in Acts 16. Does anybody remember what was going on in Acts 16? Paul was the first man to arrive in Macedonia to preach the gospel. Until this starts happening, nobody's been there to preach Jesus Christ. It's not like going into a city in America where everybody's heard of Jesus. He's going, he's, he's breaking new ground. He's entering new territory. Nobody's heard the story yet. Paul's the very first one to get there. And this man, this man, I don't believe, first of all, that he was even talking about his soul when he said, what shall I do to be saved? He was looking at a jail that was crumbling. He was looking at prisoners that he thought had escaped. He knew that by morning's light there was a good chance he'd be put to death. He's not thinking about his soul. But Paul used the opportunity to start directing his thoughts towards his soul. And so Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, I find it interesting that people don't want to keep reading this verse. They want to put the period after the word saved. I submit to you tonight that if this is the formula for salvation, Paul is only talking to the jailer. Does everybody agree with that? He's not talking to his family yet. He's never been inside the man's house yet. They're still in the jail. He's talking only to the jailer. And he says to the jailer, If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved and your family. All right, now hang on. Hang on. If all it takes is to believe, if that's what this means, then Paul said to the jailer, the minute you believe, your whole family is going to be saved. Whether they believe or not. That's what he said. If that's, if we're going to interpret it your way, then he is telling us that the instant you believe, you and your family are saved. But obviously that's not what he's saying. What he is saying to a group of people who don't know the story, who aren't, who don't understand. Paul is saying, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you some things in a moment that are going to lead you and your house to salvation. This has got to be future tense and thou shalt 
in the future be saved. Not at the moment you believe. Now, I'm telling you that Paul did not just say believe. And I'm going to prove that because we shouldn't stop reading with verse 31. We need to keep reading this story. Let's go on to verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Oh, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord. And to all that were in and to all that were in his house. And so now he is beginning to preach to him and his family. All right, let's read on. And he took them the same hour of the night. And he took them the same hour of the night. And washed their, washed stripes, their stripes. And was baptized. Whoa, and was what? What, what, what evidently, uh, what was it that Paul preached to him when he preached the word of the Lord? He must have preached baptism. Because this jailer took him the same hour of the night and was baptized. Now, look. You gotta understand, Roman jailers who just take a prisoner out of the prison, who take this kind of a chance, put themselves in the hand of the prisoner. If they were caught, Rome could have put them to death. This man was risking his life to go be baptized of his prisoner. Evidently, Paul must have preached baptism pretty ferociously. I mean, he must have laid it out there pretty strong. You gotta be baptized. And this man was willing to risk his life and he was baptized. He and all his straightway. And so Paul preached baptism when he preached the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you that Paul did not just say, just believe. But Paul told him, the first thing you got to do is believe. But I've got some more preaching to do. If believing was all it took, there's no need for him to preach the word of the Lord to this man. He got him where he wanted him. He's got him saved. Let's just pack our bags and go. But he wasn't saved just because he believed. He had to be baptized. Amen. In Jesus' name. Praise God. All right, let's, let's move on. Number three. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 is another one of these passages that uh, I have given to me from time to time. So let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. Here's the argument. The argument is baptism is a work. And when you preach that you've got to be saved, you're preaching salvation by works. A lot of times they call this doctrine... Faith plus nothing minus nothing. You are saved by faith alone. End of discussion. Now, I'm telling you that there's a real problem with this kind of philosophy. When you look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, he said we are saved by grace through faith. All right, put it back up there, would you? Uh, Ephesians 2 and 8, put that back up there. For by, and we'll say by, by grace are you saved through faith. You didn't say you're saved by faith. You're saved through faith, but you're saved by grace. I'm telling you, it's the grace of God that any of us are saved. God's got to extend His grace to us for any of us to be saved. But it's not just a simple act of believing that saves you. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's neither our works nor our faith alone that saves us. It's His grace. 
But faith becomes the agent through which grace is made available to us. But even here the word faith does not mean simple belief. This word faith does not mean just a mental acknowledgement. That's what people are being told all over the world. Believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, you're saved. The Bible does not define faith that way. That's man's definition of faith. The Bible gives us a Greek word, pistos, which really means a firm conviction. In fact, it is, it is such a conviction that it compels you to obey. Now, I'm telling you that if you don't obey, you don't have faith. So somebody who says, well, I believe. Oh, really? Maybe we ought to go to the book of James and see what he has to say about just believing. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Faith, if it hath not works, is dead. What good is a dead faith? If all you're doing is saying, I believe, and you're not doing anything about what you say you believe, your faith is dead. That kind of faith can't save you. In fact, let's read some more in this chapter. Uh, James chapter 2, verses 23 to 26. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then... How that by works, by works, a man is, a justified, man is justified, and not by, and faith, not only. by faith only. Likewise, <laughs> also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Yeah. This, this, is, this is an interesting thing here because James makes it very clear. That if your faith is not partnered with works, your faith is doing you no good whatsoever. It's dead. It's not alive. It's not going to save. It's interesting. I've mentioned many times the radio program that I was on was Ola Levitt. And uh, I brought up the book of James to him. And, well, he got very upset. He got very upset. He said, wait just a minute. You can't do that. You can't take a book that was written to people that are already saved and try to use it to tell people about being saved. Oh, really? Oh, really? So what happened to Romans chapter 10? Well, praise God. That's what they always want to use, Romans chapter 10. That tells you how to, no, that's written to people that's already saved. It's not telling you how to get saved. It's written to people already saved. Well, yes, James is written to people already saved. There's no question about that. But he is explaining the whole process of faith. And he says very clearly that faith, whether it's saving faith or any other kind of faith, if it is not accompanied by works, it's really not faith. You're justified not just by what you believe, but by what you do. Amen. Let's, let's, look, let's look a little bit more at, at some things here. First John chapter 2 and verse 4. He that saith, I know him. Now, now is this in your Bible? Is First John in your Bible? I, I want to make sure you don't have one of those wild translations that cuts about half of it out. But and I, I'm not against using some other translations for... Study sake and all that, and uh, there are problems within the King James. We we know that. However, I just am troubled by any of the translations that just cut out verses. It's another study for another day, but they're based on different sets of manuscripts. And the fact of the matter is, the majority of manuscripts agree with the King James, and they choose to use the minority texts to translate these other versions, and that's why. A lot of the versions, NIV and some other versions, uh, leave out a lot of scriptures. They're based on minority texts that, that leave these things out. 
Um, that's why as imperfect as it is and as outdated as some of the language really is, we still stay with the King James because not because we think Peter and Paul spoke in thee and thou language. Somebody said if the King James Bible was good enough for John the Baptist, it's good enough for me. We, we don't we don't believe we don't believe John the Baptist or anybody else uh, prior to sixteen hundred used the King James. What we do know and understand is that the King James and a few other translations uh, are based upon the majority of the ancient texts that we have, and uh, that's why we do that. So anyhow, just want to make sure you got First John two and four in your Bible. Here's what it says. He that saith, I know Whoever him, says, I know God, and keepeth not his and does not keep God's commandments, is a liar. <sighs> and the truth is I, not in him. Look, I didn't write this. All right. I know that's strong language. And I know the House of Representatives just reprimanded a guy for using this kind of language. They'll probably reprimand preachers for using it somewhere. That's that's probably coming. Um, Anyhow, don't get me started on politics. I I am so stirred up over some things I've heard today. Just God help me. Uh, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments. John said, that man is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So, So look, look. I know folks will tell me you're being judgmental. I'm not making this judgment. Are you following me? I'm not making this judgment. The Bible made this judgment. The Bible says anybody who says they know God, but they will not do what God tells them to do, they are a liar. They don't know God. If they knew Him, they would do what He says. Well, that's, I know that strong language, and I'm telling you, that's why a lot of the church world looks at us and calls us legalists. Well, call us whatever you want to call us. I don't care. I just know this much. The Bible says, if I say I know God and I won't do what God tells me, I'm a liar. So I'm going to do what God tells me to do. So, It is simply impossible to be saved by faith plus nothing minus nothing. Especially in light of this scripture we read earlier, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth doth also 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 now now save us. us. Look, do I need any commentary on this? Can we understand what Peter just said? Baptism doth also now what? Save us! I'm telling you, somebody who will not obey the commands of God, John said, they don't know God. They don't know God. If they knew Him, they would obey Him. Didn't Jesus make a statement one time, if you love me, keep my commandments? Did He say it? If you love me, keep my commandments. That's why, you know, I've I've dealt with this before, and and I don't know if any of you have this bumper sticker. If you do, I'm not addressing you, but, you know, there used to be a bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus. And uh, somebody came out with a reply, said, if you love Jesus, tithe, any old goose can honk. Well, I can tell you this much, if you love Jesus, obey Him. If you love Jesus, do what He says do. Don't call Him Lord if you're not going to obey. If you don't obey, He's not your Lord. If you don't obey, He's not your Master. What does the word Master mean? We don't hardly use the word Lord anymore. When it was translated that way in the King James Bible, they understood what the word Lord meant. We don't use that term, but we do use the word Master. We understand what that means. And if we're going to call Him our Master, we're going to have to obey Him. If we don't obey, He's not our Master. It's that simple. Amen, amen. Now, one other thing I want to just throw in here uh, very quickly. Uh, 
James said that we are justified by works. Can you go back and get for me James chapter 2 and verse 24? I just want to put that back up on the wall here real quick. James 2 and 24, and it's it's back in the reading there somewhere, Brother Dell. If you'll find that and read that for me, James 2 and 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. All right. So we are justified by by what? We're justified by works. Now, with that in mind, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, uh-huh. but you are washed. But you are what? Washed. What, what is that word, church? You're washed, all right? But you are sanctified. All right, you're sanctified. But you are justified. But you are, what is this word? justified, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And by the Spirit of our God. And by the Spirit of our God. You're washed, you're sanctified, you are justified through two things. Jesus' name and the Spirit of God. Sounds a lot like John 3 and 5 to me. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is that what Jesus said? All right. Paul said the way that you have been washed and sanctified and justified is by two elements, the name of Jesus and the Spirit of God. How does the name of Jesus come into this equation? Not by saying Lord Jesus, because Jesus said not everyone who says Lord, Lord is going to be saved. So the only way the name of Jesus can come into this is when we get you in the water and we say the name of Jesus at baptism. Hallelujah. And then you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then you can say, I've been washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Praise God. All right. One last thing that I want to bring up here tonight, and that is, it's an interesting one. It's not quite as common, but I have heard it uh, on occasion in, in talking to people, especially one particular church group uh, that I've dealt with. They they like to say that uh, they'll agree with Acts 2.38. They quote Acts 2.38. In fact, I'll never forget the first time I saw them take an ad out of newspaper and quote Acts 2.38. I was shocked. I you know, of course, I was a young convert, and, and uh, I thought, man, I thought that was just our Scripture. I didn't know anybody else used that Scripture. And uh, I was very surprised that they were quoting Acts 2.38. And, and I had a, a school uh, friend who attended that particular church. And so I talked to him. I said, well, now, what is all this you're using Acts 2.38? I said, you baptize in Jesus' name? Oh, yes, absolutely, we baptize in Jesus' name. I said, really? He said, Yes. I said, so when you baptize folks, you say in the name of Jesus? Oh, no, no. We don't say in the name of Jesus. We say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I said, well, I thought you said you baptize in Jesus' name. He said, we do. Well, it, it was a little confusing to me until I came to understand that they teach that when you say in the name of Jesus, what that means is by the authority of Jesus. So they take every reference in the book of Acts where it says to be baptized in the name of Jesus and they say that simply means by the authority of. But Matthew 28, 19 means repeat this phrase in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's still a little confusing, but that's why they'll quote all these scriptures saying in Jesus' name, but they mean by His authority. They say that's what in the name of means. And um, they will uh, go to scriptures that would talk about casting out devils in the name. And, and they say that that means by his authority. When you do things in the name, you're doing it by their authority. It's, it's kind of like they would tell you a policeman saying, stop in the name of the law. That just means by the authority of the law. And so... When, when Peter said in Acts 2.38, be baptized in the name of Jesus, he didn't literally mean say that name. He just meant 
use Jesus' authority to do it. But Jesus has already told us how he wants it done when he said Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All right, everybody's got their argument. That's, that's what they tell me. To me, there's a very, very simple explanation. You know, one of the things that I've said over and over and over as we've done any kind of Bible study is the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. You want to know how to interpret a verse? Find another verse. Right? All right, so if we're going to accept the premise that in the name of means by the authority of, then I want us to go to Mark chapter 13 and look at verses 5 and 6. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. Take heed, lest any man do what? Deceive you. Read. For many shall come. For many shall come. How? In my name. In my name. Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Look, is Jesus saying there are going to come deceivers? Many deceivers will come by his authority? He's giving them the authority to come and deceive people? I don't think so. You know, the scripture, the scripture gives us, gives us such a beautiful way to answer other scripture. All right, if I got your attention again. I'll give you a minute and laugh it out and then we'll come back. All right. <clears throat> I I do not believe that Jesus was saying, "Many shall come by my authority." And deceive many. He's not giving them the authority to deceive people. When he said they shall come in my name, he explained they will say, I am Christ. Hallelujah. I heard this argument many years ago, and I don't have the scriptures right here in front of me, but but um, I, I, during a debate uh, between one of these preachers and an apostolic preacher, uh, I was there. And uh, th- this preacher got up and told the apostolic, he said, look, the Bible tells of a time when David sent his men to Nabal. And David told them, you go in the name of David and you tell him that we've kept his flock safe and this, that, and the other. He said, now, don't, don't try to tell me that they all showed up and said, David, 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 David. When David said that, he meant by my authority. And I'll never forget the response because the man just simply opened his Bible and read the story. And it said, when they went, Nabal said, who is David? Somebody said his name. Somebody called his name. (laughs) Well, praise God. I'm telling you, when the Bible says in the name of, it's not talking about by his authority. It literally means to call his name. In fact, in fact, when you go back to the original Greek, the, the, the phrase in the name, uh, literally, literally should be translated at the mention of the name. That's, that's the literal translation of, of the Greek phrase in the name. At the mention of the name. Or when the name is mentioned. Or using the name. These are, these are ways, there's two different ways that in the name is, is used in the scripture. Uh, two different Greek words. In, uh, to onomatai, or, or, uh, uh, epi, to onomatai. And that, the, Either way, one is uh, at the mention of the name, and the other is when the name is mentioned. So, so either way, we're looking at the literal calling of the name of Jesus. When Peter stood up and said, be baptized in the name of Jesus, he wasn't saying be baptized with his authority. He was saying be baptized calling on the name that is above every name. 
Well, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm glad for truth tonight. I'm glad for truth tonight. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 5 is an important verse of Scripture for us as we try to bring this study to a close. The Bible says there is one Lord. One Lord. There is one faith. One faith. And there is one baptism. One baptism. There's only one that God recognizes. So this is why it is so important that we do it right. There's only one baptism that God recognizes. There's only one baptism that God honors. I mentioned a while ago the Apostle Paul said, if you preach anything other than what the Apostles preached, you're to be accursed. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8 says this, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It's very, very clear. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter uh, what they call themselves. It doesn't matter if they've got wings, a halo, and a harp. If they're preaching anything different than what the apostles preached, Paul said they're cursed of God. Amen. And so we've got to preach what the apostles preached. And I've already shown you every one of the apostles baptized using the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friend, let's, let's never, ever be guilty of the same thing uh, the Pharisees were guilty of. Mark chapter 7 and verse number 9. And I'm, I'm coming to a close. Sister Riggin, come. Mark 7 and verse 9. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. I'm telling you, there are millions of people who are doing this very thing. You can show them in the Scripture, the Bible says in Jesus' name, but they keep hanging on to their traditions. They keep hanging on to what they've always been taught, what they've always believed. And I'm telling you, they're no different than the Pharisees. They are rejecting the commandment of God so that they can keep their own tradition. I don't want to do that. I want to follow the truth. Amen. Amen. Listen, listen to what the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter number 15, verses 22 and 23. And Samuel said, At the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey, to obey is, better, is than better than sacrifice. And to hearken, and to hearken than, the fat, than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. All right, let's, let's move on. I want to show you, I, I, I quoted this a while ago, got a little ahead of myself. Let's go to John chapter 14 and verse number 15. It's very simple. If you love me, Keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, this is what I expect. Keep my commandments. In fact, he said it again in verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love if me, a man love me he, will keep my he will. He will do what? Keep my words. You know, I've, I've told this church about a conversation I had many years ago with a lady. I was quoting scripture to her, and finally she picked up her Bible. It was sitting there on the counter, and um, she she picked it up and she thrust it at me, and she said, "Show me where it says I have to obey this book." Okay, here we go. Jesus answered and said unto him, "If a man love me." He will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If he love me, he will keep my words. Sim sounds simple enough to me. You really love God, you're going to do what the Bible tells you to do. Amen, amen, amen. And one of those commandments we have seen over and over again is to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, praise God. Let's close with John 8 and 32. 
Ye shall know the truth. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall and make the you truth, free. The truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. I love it. It doesn't say it'll set you free. It'll make you free. Because he's going to make you all over again. You're going to be a new creation. It's not the old man that's been set free. He just makes a brand new man. Old things are passed away. And all things are become new. Well, hallelujah. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, praise God. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord tonight. Let's thank Him for that truth that makes us free. Come on, let's love Him, everybody. Let's love Him. Let's love Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's only one, 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 one way to God. One, 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 one way to God. There's only one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, there's one, 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 one way to God. There's one, one, one. One way to God, there's only one, 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 one way to God, baptized in Jesus' name. Well, it's the water and the Spirit, one way to God, the water and the Spirit, one way to God, the water and the Spirit, one way to God, baptized in Jesus' name, there's only one, 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 one way to God. There's only one, 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 one way to God. There's only one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name.